Uh, good day, everyone, and uh, thank you for joining our uh, webinar. Uh, we're going to talk about chromatography uh, troubleshooting, and we are going to limit it to uh, what you could do at the user level. Uh, why would a user want to do any sort of troubleshooting? Well, just to save time. Uh, sometimes the problem is simple enough that you can fix it yourself and just get on with your work and get the system running uh, more quickly. Uh, we'll discuss how to check a system to maximize readiness for doing your purification. And these checks reduce the opportunity to lose your valuable compounds. And uh, we might, uh, if we have time, to discuss how you can uh, recover your compound. Uh, we're going to go over the basics first, uh, some of the basics of chromatography. Uh, we're going to talk about peak retention issues, uh, peak shape issues. Uh, what happens if your detector seems to be acting up? And uh, a little bit of time on column chemistry. Uh, how can your chemistry cause your chromatography to act up and things that you can do to avoid issues? So the very basics, uh, well, how does it work? And by knowing the basics, you can limit the causes. In other words, you can think about, well, I see this happening and therefore that rules out certain failure modes and uh, it makes it easier to figure out exactly what's going on. You can logically determine where the problem lies. <clears throat> we'll start off with columns now. Uh, normal phase, uh, it's defined as the stationary phase uh, being uh, more polar than the solvent. Uh, these include silica gel, alumina, these are always normal phase. Uh, there's some other uh, types of columns such as uh, diol, cyano, and amine. If you're running organic solvents without water, those will act as normal phase. And we have a poster up on our website that describes how these columns work. And even though it talks about flash chromatography, it still applies to any system, whether it's flash chromatography or prep HPLC using those columns. Reverse phase uh, came about a little bit later than normal phase, so people had to call it something, so they call it reverse phase. And we call it that because it's reversed. The stationary phase is less polar than the solvent. Stationary phase columns include C18, C8, C4, and polymeric reverse phase. Cyano is usually reverse phase with an aqueous mobile phase, although there's a handful of exceptions. Dial and amine, they might be reverse phase or they might be normal phase when you're running water. And I won't go into the details, but again, we have some application notes and posters up on our website that give you a hint about when those columns run as normal phase and when they run as reverse phase. Things that we will not discuss today include ion exchange and uh, size exclusion uh, chromatography. Uh, those aren't run quite so often, and you can uh, send an email to uh, us over at Teledyne if you have problems with those, and maybe we can help you. Uh, we're going to talk about solvent strength over here. A strong solvent caused the compound to move down the column, and the weak solvent just adjusts the strength of the strong solvent. Uh, we won't be discussing today uh, anything about uh, solvent selectivity uh, or anything like that, just simply solvent strength. And the one thing that you might find of interest is that these uh, different solvents, uh, in normal phase, your weak solvent is hexane, uh, cyclohexane, pet ether. However, in reverse phase, those would be considered strong solvents. Likewise, when you're running uh, normal phase, uh, water is a strong solvent, yet it's the weak solvent in reverse phase. This also holds if you add modifiers to the solvent as well, such as triethylamine or trifluoroacetic acid or something else. Uh, you're not really changing the solvent strength that much. It might be modified slightly, but this progression will still hold. Uh, the other thing is all of these solvents are actually used for 
uh, these uh, normal phase and reverse phase, with the exception of these guys in bracket, uh, which I list here because they are used very often for injection. They are very useful for making a concentrated uh, injection of your sample. Uh, however, they do occasionally create problems, and we will discuss that a little bit later. Uh, if you're doing supercritical fluid chromatography, the carbon dioxide would be your uh, weak solvent in that case. So uh, just to get us down the uh, path over here, uh, uh, what happens if a peak if only strong solvent is available? How will it affect the chromatography? We're going to find out in just a uh, second over here. Uh, First thing that you should do is check the retention time of a standard. So if you have a uh, compound that uh, comes out too early, you might have uh, too much strong solvent. But you just synthesized a compound or you just isolated a compound. So you don't know a lot about the compound, maybe. You might know its functional groups, but you don't know how it will run chromatographically on the, uh, on the column. So uh, what you do is try to run a standard, a standard reference compound. We have a test mix that works uh, for C18 and normal phase that works uh, pretty well. And we know how that behaves. Uh, when you run your sample, you don't necessarily know if you created the correct compound and it might dilute earlier or later than you might have expected. By running a reference compound, you know how it behaves, and you can see if it shows early elution, which is too much strong solvent, or too little weak solvent. Uh, the other thing to look for is check the flow rate. Uh, if the compound's coming out too early, that usually suggests that one either set the flow rate incorrectly or loaded a method that was intended for a different column because the increased flow will generally make peaks run a little bit faster. The other thing you will see is increased back pressure. Now, if the test compound comes out too late, that suggests too little strong solvent or too much weak solvent, okay? Uh, these things with the solvent, if you have too much of one, uh, that uh, suggests one thing. If you have too little of the other solvent, it suggests maybe a pump or a leak uh, issue. Uh, again, later lucian could be something to do with the flow rate. If you have a method intended for a smaller column or set the wrong flow rate, again, peaks will come out later than you expected. You might also make sure that there's no leaks, uh, make sure that all of the fittings are on tight. Uh, make sure that the pump is uh, running uh, correctly as well. So uh, issues with peak retention, uh, the peak eludes too early, okay? There's really two major causes aside from uh, the flow rate we discussed on the previous slide. You either have too much strong solvent or not enough weak solvent. So how can you get too much strong solvent? Uh, one reason is uh, you might have dissolved the sample in a strong solvent, DMSO, DMF. Uh, if you remember a couple of slides ago, those solvents have a strength somewhere in between water and methanol. So if your compound eludes with a solvent system that requires mostly uh, water, very little organic solvent added, you might want to try diluting that with a weak solvent. On reverse phase, it's better to inject a large volume of weak solvent. It will focus your sample at the top of the column. The other thing is uh, check your sample loop if you're doing a manual injection. Uh, when you do a manual injection, what's going to be in the loop at the end of the run is whatever the pre previous run finished at. So if the uh, last run had a wash step running with 100% B solvent, uh, B solvent will be considered the, the strong solvent in these uh, discussion, while A solvent is the weak solvent. Uh, it's gonna be filled up with strong solvent, and even if you dissolved your sample in water and injected it, the loop is still filled with strong solvent, and that could cause your compound to elute uh, very early, and I'll have an image of that later. 
another problem is uh, chemical issues, and we'll talk about that a little bit uh, later. Uh, was the correct column uh, chosen? Uh, there was one time I ran something and the compound eluded very early, and I found out that someone replaced my C18 column with a silica column on a prep LC system. And uh, while it's perfectly okay to run acetyl nitro and uh, water hemp on a uh, silica column for very, very polar compounds, it doesn't work very well if you're trying to run it as C18. Uh, another issue with columns is sometimes columns get worn out. Uh, prep columns uh, take a bit of a beating compared to analytical columns. Uh, they get all kinds of stuff loaded on them. Uh, they're used a lot with uh, buffers and, uh, and modifiers. Uh, another thing is phase collapse that we will also talk about uh, in the next slide over here. So early elution, uh, you see this on C18 or longer chains. And this one's kind of hard to diagnose because the column might work uh, fine for a while it will often fail after sitting for some time in a highly aqueous solvent like one or two percent uh, organic solvent in water. Uh, I once had a customer call me and said that they were running a uh, column and it ran perfectly well and then they equilibrated it uh, for the next run and then went to lunch. And what they wanted to do is when they come back to lunch, make the injection and get it running in this way, they would save time. Uh, what they found out was the compound just shot right through the column and it didn't interact with the column at all. The uh, image uh, in the lower right over here shows what's happening is uh, C18 normally uh, interacts with the solvent and stays out, but uh, after the column sits a while, the C18 starts to interact with itself instead of with the solvent. And so what happens then is that if it's interacting with itself, it can't interact with your compound and it shoots right through. The way to fix that is very simple. You just wash your column with your strong V solvent. Uh, that causes the change to interact with the solvent once again. You're essentially reconditioning the column and uh, then you can uh, keep running it. Uh, what you might also do is consider using an AQ type column. Uh, we do have a C18 AQ column, which is very useful for these sorts of very, very polar compounds where phase collapse would be a concern. Uh, early elution, again, uh, you're not getting enough A solvent over here. Uh, so your B solvent is a bit higher. Um, Look at your back pressure and make sure that your back pressure is what you expect because if the back pressure is too low, that means that you're not getting enough solvent into the system even if your compound comes out very early. So get a sense for how your column usually runs in the solvent that you want to use. Uh, you might just run a dummy run at the beginning and just see that uh, things are working uh, as well and wash the co uh, column off. So uh, you look for leaks, uh, that would be in your A solvent, and so your back pressure would be low. Uh, look for air bubbles, again, in your A pump, and we're assuming you're doing high pressure mixing in uh, this uh, case here. Uh, you see drastic changes in back pressure. Uh, make sure that the correct solvent is chosen. Uh, on some systems, you load up a column, and the system has default solvents if you have a uh, solvent switching uh, system. Make sure that the method uses the solvent that you intended. Make sure that the solvent lines are put into the correct bottles. Sometimes you put the bottles out and you're in a hurry and you put the uh, line into the wrong bottle. Sometimes you switch the lines and so if your B line is sitting in water and your A line is sitting in your strong solvent, when you try to run a gradient, you're going to start off with mostly strong solvent and everything comes out early. Uh, another possibility is contaminated solvent, and that happens if you're doing several runs and try to top off the solvent. So you might, if you suspect uh, that happening, just 
replace the solvent bottle with one that you know has the correct solvent in it. Uh, another possibility is one simply ran out of a solvent. Again, a clue would be low back pressure. And many systems that we make have active solvent level sensing that prevents that one from happening. Now, what happens on the other side? Your compound comes out too late. Okay, late elution. Many of the causes are the same. Uh, you might have uh, leaks, in particular your B solvent, uh, or after the mixer, uh, air bubbles in the B pump if, you, if your system has high pressure mixing. Again, are the correct solvents chosen? Solvent lines are in the correct bottles, contaminated solvent. This, last, this next one, the solvent is not made correctly. Some people will uh, take their water and add five or 10% organic solvent, methanol or acetyl nitro, and they do that to keep stuff from growing in the water. Uh, if someone forgot to add the five or 10% organic solvent, that makes the solvent weaker than they expected and causes late elution. Again, uh, the possibility is uh, you ran out of B solvent, so only one pump is uh, delivering solvent, and, uh, or you only are sucking from the strong solvent, and again, active solvent management prevents this from happening. The next thing we will uh, discuss includes uh, peak shape. Uh, peak shape uh, includes splitting where a single peak actually looks like it is multiple compounds eluding. Uh, if you have a mass spectrometer, all of those peaks will have the same mass and the same fragmentation pattern. Another type of peak shape is called fronting, where the back end of the peak looks normal, but the front of the peak is uh, leading the peak and it uh, doesn't look quite right, it doesn't look symmetrical. Uh, one more thing that you see is tailing and uh, the front of the peak looks normal, it comes up and then it gradually uh, decays and it takes, it seems to take forever for all of the compound to come out. So uh, injection solvent can cause some uh, very odd peak shapes. Uh, you could get some splitting uh, because the solvent carries some of the sample down the column. You could get fronting, and you can even see peaks that merge together. And this next slide shows some examples. So uh, going from top to bottom, you have a proper uh, chromatogram and then the chromatogram uh, with a problem. And uh, two different situations over here. In the top one over here, this is what we expected, and the second, the second one is the uh, what it looks like uh, with a little bit of strong solvent that got into the system somehow. So in this case, the low still there. In this case over here. The, uh, the system had some uh, strong solvent in the loop and that caused these two peaks to both merge together and even a loop very near the solvent front. In this uh, next one over here, uh, I have a sample. This first peak is actually DMSO, which was used to inject the sample. And then uh, I tried to inject a little bit more and you see that this First peak over here is splitting a little bit, and then the peaks also tended to merge together and merge with the DMSO. So in this case over here, it just didn't uh, run very well. Uh, stand by, okay. Okay, uh, column issues. Uh, was the correct column used? Uh, if I mentioned before using silica instead of a C18 column and uh, my peaks came out at the wrong time, uh, was the column worn out? Has the frit been clogged? If you have a clogged frit, what happens is some of the sample gets onto the column 
and then parts of the sample have to go around the clog and come onto the column a little bit later, and that can cause a very odd looking peak shape. Another thing that causes uh, peak shape is just normal chromatography. Over here, we have some overloading that's going on uh, here. Uh, the peaks have this characteristic triangular shape or shark fin shape, and that's normal. And for preparative HPLC, preparative chromatography, that's perfectly acceptable. We are not trying to integrate those peaks at all. Another thing that you see are flat top peaks, and all that is is the detector being overloaded. I've also seen on other uh, LC systems where instead of getting a flat top peak, the peak goes up and then it goes down and goes negative. And then sometimes after uh, a period of time, you see the peak come up again. And then as the peak eludes, it goes back down, goes negative again, and then comes up positive again, and then it goes away uh, and it, the back end looks like a normal peak. Uh, that's a function of the detector system. I suspect it's just a computer uh, thing where they used something, uh, they stored the data in one format that allows it to go negative. There's nothing really wrong with that. The problem uh, with those sorts of uh, issues is that you can't necessarily see if there's an impurity in the peak. On Teledyne ISCO systems, you can use all wavelength collection, and that gives you another trace that uh, is less likely to go off scale. Or what you can use also is just, instead of using the Lambda Max, just work off the side of the uh, peak so it doesn't saturate quite the same way. Another thing you sometimes see are, are something called ghost peaks. Okay, these are from uh, either the solvent or previous runs. Uh, this is a run which shows three peaks over here, and the next run didn't show that peak at all. Okay, so what happened in this case was that I had run the, col the column with a natural product that was pretty crude, and so even though I washed it, when I changed over to a different solvent, a stronger solvent, that peak came off towards the uh, end of my run over here. When I ran it the second time, that peak had uh, disappeared. So that suggests that I have an impurity from a previous run that uh, came off. And the clue that tells me it's a ghost peak is I just simply did not see it on the second run. Sometimes the solvent, in particular the water, uh, sometimes will have organic compounds in it and you get these ghost peaks that show up and uh, they look to be pretty small. One way that you can check that is just to run a blank run with no injection at all, just equilibrate the same way. And then when you do a run, if you see peaks, even though you've injected nothing, there's a reasonable chance that it's coming from your solvent. If you want to see which solvent it is, uh, just do a longer equilibration with mostly water. If you double the equilibration time and the ghost peak gets uh, double, it suggests also that it's a solvent issue and it might well be in, uh, in the water. Now we talk about detectors and problems that you can see with those. Uh, detectors, you have your uh, UV vis and uh, issues that could come up is the flow cell, maybe something is in the flow cell, maybe it precipitated out and uh, so it's blocking some of the light or maybe your flow cell is starting to get solarized. Uh, that's not such a problem uh, on fairly new systems. It's only really old systems that you might see that uh, just because of the age of the system. Maybe the lamp is acting up, but more than likely things that a user could do is make sure you're using the correct wavelength. Um, you can use the all wavelength collection and this way uh, it will see something even if you entered the wrong wavelength. 
Uh, there's one time I did a purification of carotene and I did a uh, UV vis on a spectrophotometer and noticed that carotene, despite its very bright red color, has absolutely no UV absorbance. All of its absorbance is up in the blue region of the visible spectrum. So again, uh, you do a run with something like that and you don't see anything. Uh, it's just I was looking at the wrong wavelength. Um, so uh, that's something that a user can check out very quickly. Another possibility is depending on your solvent, maybe the solvent is actually hiding your compound. Uh, again, uh, choose another wa uh, wavelength if possible. Uh, that happens more on flash chromatography. Uh, has the compound eluded correctly? Uh, so if you don't see a peak, did your compound actually elute? Uh, wash with a strong solvent and see if something comes out at that point. Uh, also, DMSO, as you might have seen on a couple of previous slides, uh, it has a pretty strong absorbance at uh, short wavelengths, and it might hide the peaks inside of that, and so you might not see your compound because it's hiding inside the DMSO. Uh, ELSD issues include uh, gas pressure. If there's no gas pressure, it can't nebulize the sample. Uh, our systems will throw an error if you uh, don't have adequate pressure. Uh, make sure that you have the correct temperature uh, settings for your ELSD. Uh, some systems you have to set that up manually, and maybe someone was had optimized the temperatures for their sample, but it might not be appropriate for the solvents you are running. Uh, always usually set the temperature, but if you're running, I uh, say, you know, a helix column, you no, know, a silica column, but running helix, that's aqueous normal phase. Uh, our system will set up the, t uh, the temperature for normal phase uh, organic solvents, and you might need to run reverse phase settings if you're running helix. Another possibility is a volatile compound. If the uh, compound itself uh, has a very low melting point, you know, like above but close to room temperature. Uh, even though it might be a solid at room temperature, sometimes it evaporates in the uh, ELSD. Uh, if the compound is liquid at room temperature, there's a very good chance that it will uh, nebulize uh, and evaporate in the ELSD and you will not see it. Uh, one possibility is a non-volatile modifier uh, was uh, used in the ELSD, uh, such as a phosphate buffer. Uh, that doesn't evaporate and it creates a high baseline so that you can't see anything. And you might ask, why in the world would someone use a phosphate buffer? Uh, well, unfortunately, there's not a lot of good buffers that work around pH 7 and uh, phosphate is one of those. Unfortunately, it's not volatile and someone's trying to get their work done and say, oh, pH 7, I'll use this and forget what detector they are using. Mass spec detectors have a few uh, more issues. Again, uh, you have nitrogen to worry about. Uh, you also have a carrier solvent because we're doing preparative LC. We split off a very small portion of the flow and then uh, send that on to the mass spectrometer, and we have another pump with what we call a carrier solvent that carries the sample to the mass spectrometer. And if that bottle runs empty, it can the sample can't get pumped to the mass spectrometer. Uh, make sure that you have the correct ion settings for your compound. Uh, and also verify the operation of the system, column detector, and everything with the test mix and sample. Um, you might have a clog someplace in the carrier line so that the sample isn't getting to the ion source. And you can tell that on our systems, uh, it will have a high back pressure on the carrier solvent. Sometimes the compounds are simply failed to ionize. Uh, if you're running ESI and you're running steroids, uh, very often steroids really only ionize very well with APCI rather than electrospray. They prefer atmospheric pressure chemical ionization. 
Another possibility is that uh, the compound ionized and then fragmented, and again, I'm talking about steroids, uh, you run those through APCI and they'll ionize and then almost immediately lose neutral water, leaving a positive charge on the rest of the molecule. And so you'll see your molecule as the M plus H with loss of water. So you see it as a fragment. Uh, sometimes the compound will ionize and then fragment into a neutral molecule that you can't see. And again, if you do a quick injection on your mass spec, uh, you can uh, check that out. Uh, one more thing that sometimes happens is ion suppression, where this happens with uh, trifluoroacetic acid and triethylamine sometimes. So just keep that in the back of your mind uh, that that could suppress your ionization somewhat. Uh, going on to chemistry over here, there's really two major issues with chemistry. Uh, you either have a issue with pH or the compound uh, is decomposing on it. Uh, we'll talk about decomposition first. Uh, we synthesized this epoxide and uh, when we tried to purify it on silica, uh, nothing came out the other side. It decomposed and I actually derivatized my silica with that compound. Uh, so I tried a different column and I used a, uh, a, a cyano column. And uh, even though the cyano is still on silica, it's still, it's a lot less reactive. I used the same uh, solvents that I did uh, for uh, my silica gel. I used hexane ethyl acetate. And fraction number two over here uh, is my compound, and we verified it uh, with NMR in there. It actually came off uh, pretty uh, pure. Uh, the other thing that could happen uh, with chemistry, we're talking about pH now, are solvent modifiers. In this case, I ran nicotine, salicylic acid, and acridine run, and I see three peaks over here. So everything's good, right? Well, let's see. I had a mass spectrometer on the system, and what I saw were this peak showed a mass of 163, and so did the second peak. And then the third peak showed 180, so I could identify both of these two as the nicotine and the acridine, and the salicylic acid just didn't show up at all. But the nicotine showed up twice, and this is an extreme case of a split peak over here, uh, where I have two peaks of the same compound, okay? Um, what it turns out is that I ran this in just methanol water without any modifier, okay? So I had some of the nicotine eluding early, some of it eluding late. Uh, this is a little unusual in the uh, shape of the peaks. Usually, if you get a peak split in such a fashion, they, the fronting and tailing usually face one another, so it looks kind of like a New York City uh, suspension bridge. I then ran it uh, the same as the last slide, except I used 0.1% TFA was added to the solvent. Now I see three peaks and I was running the mass spectrometer in positive mode. So I see my 163, my nicotine eludes a lot earlier because it's been uh, ionized uh, because of the uh, TFA. My acridine is showing up as a nice peak now. And now I see my sal salicylic acid finally eluding. Uh, running an acid compound in an acidic uh, solvent, I can then unionize, so to speak, the acid. It's a uh, neutral molecule and it will loot perhaps a little bit uh, later. So uh, one thing to keep in mind is the pKa of your functional groups. So if you have a uh, basic compound, its pKa is around eight, try running it acidic at around pH four or so, and it will come out a bit earlier, but it will stay as one peak. If you're running acidic, you either force it to be as the uh, full uh, uh, free base or as its conjugate acid as a salt. 
Um, one other thing to keep in mind when working with pH is uh, a lot of columns are based on silica gel. Okay, you have to read the instructions for your column because some columns run fine under basic conditions. Most of them, though, do not. The underlying silica dis, uh, dissolves and you damage the column. So, again, this is any manufacturer. Read the instructions that came with your column to make sure you can run above pH 7 or 7.5 on a silica-based C18 column. A little bit more about the chemistry. Uh, we're talking about the solvent modifiers over here. In this experiment here, I was purifying an alkaloid, quinine to be uh, uh, exact, and I ran uh, a scouting gradient, okay? And on our new systems that uh, we have, uh, we have a way of running a scouting gradient, and it will generate a focus gradient for you very easily from that scouting uh, gradient. But in this run over here, the peak came out pretty late, and so we calculated a focus gradient and the compound now came out at the solvent front. Okay, uh, we had no solvent modifier. In this next run, I added 0.1% formic acid and now the peak eluded earlier on the scouting gradient. Okay, then it calculated a focus gradient for me and the compound came out uh, very nicely and it's well resolved from its impurity over here. Okay, uh, this is not a fault of the calculation, it's just the chromatography that it sees. In this first run over here, the scouting gradient had the compound come out very late, so it generated a gradient with a lot of organic solvent in it and so it came out earlier. In this next run over here, the compound uh, behaved a little bit better. You can see the peak shape looks a bit better than in this first run over here. And it gave us a very nice focused gradient that we could then use to purify the compound. So how can you avoid problems? Uh, when you first install a column, uh, test it. Uh, run a uh, some sort of test sample. Again, uh, we supply a test uh, mixture that works uh, for, uh, for several different types of columns. Uh, just do a quick run with that. Uh, or uh, when you buy a column and you look at the instruction sheet, there's usually a QA sheet that comes with the column and they list the compounds that uh, they tested with the column. So go ahead and get some of those compounds and uh, run the uh, uh, column with those and uh, save that chromatogram when you install the column, okay? The reason why you want to save it is so that you can periodically run some comparisons. The, the chromatograph that you will get will not be the same as the test chromatogram that came with the column because they used a different instrument than you, than you are using. Uh, that system that the column manufacturer uses is dedicated to one purpose only, and that's uh, quality control, and it's very highly optimized to make the plate counts look very nice. Uh, so if the retention times are somewhat different or the peak shape is somewhat different, as long as they're symmetrical, I wouldn't worry too much about it on a new column. Just save that chromatogram and then uh, periodically run that test mixture again and make sure that the peaks still look the same. Uh, next thing that you want to do is uh, at the end of the day when the systems are going to be put to sleep, wash the system and remove the modifiers and the buffers. Okay, that cleans any modifiers and buffers from the pump so there's no chance of uh, something like phosphate precipitating in the pump head overnight. Uh, it also washes the column. It helps the column last longer. Again, a lot of C18, uh, uh, while you can run uh, acidic uh, solvents and you can run it uh, without too much difficulty, it does very, very, very slowly si uh, hydrolyze the, si the silo ethers that hold the C18 in place. And I found that washing the column at the end of the day uh, extended my column lifetimes a lot, and this is well before I joined Teledynisco, so it wasn't just our columns. 
uh, wash the column with bee solvent and that reduces ghost peaks. Uh, the other thing that you want to do is filter your sample before injection. If you have an automatic injection system uh, like the auto injector or the auto sampler, uh, it's just easier on that system. Uh, it's also easier if you do a manual injection because the, uh, the inside of the injector is just two pieces of plastic that are pushed together to make a very nice seal. And if it has to uh, roll over some crunchy bits because the sample wasn't injected, uh, wasn't uh, filtered rather, uh, that tends to wear the faces of the injector down faster and it causes leaks. So try to filter your sample. Uh, you could centrifuge it down, but then if you do that, don't try to pick up from the very bottom of the tube because that's where all the particles are. Okay, it's really much easier on the uh, column fritz as well because it doesn't, the particles don't clog your frit up as we discussed earlier. Uh, if you're using a mass spectrometer, verify that the compound does indeed ionize. Uh, make sure that the solvent mo uh, modifiers are compatible with the detectors being used. So again, if you're using a mass spec or an ELSD, no phosphate buffers. Uh, if you're uh, using a mass spec, uh, you know, uh, trifluoroacetic acid sometimes suppresses ionization. However, if you see your compound on your analytical HPLC, uh, it should work on your prep uh, LCMS uh, just as well. And uh, another thing that you might want to do is a uh, little bit of a pre-flight. Uh, if you don't use the uh, system very often, uh, what you might do is make a list of what solvents you need, uh, which solvent lines take what solvent, and just kind of pre-flight the system before running it. Make sure the correct column is uh, installed um, and it's installed in the, in the correct uh, position if you have multiple column choices. Um, the other thing is uh, do a test run to verify that the system is running uh, correctly. Uh, either a very light sample load or preferably some sort of known mixture. Uh, it saves your sample. Uh, if the compound hasn't been run for a while, it makes sure that it's put together correctly. It makes sure that while it was in hibernation, nothing went bad. Or if the user hasn't run the system for a while, I'd rather lose a test mix than uh, something I just uh, synthesized. Uh, one other thing is if your compound gets stuck on the column, uh, you might uh, remember from our discussion of strong and weak solvents. Uh, no, after you get the problem seems to be resolved, just use strong solvent and just pump your compound off and uh, you know collect it in the uh, out the waistline if you need to. No, uh, come off. You have to evaporate it down and then reinject it, but at least you get it back uh, if you can wash it off. And uh, I thank you very much for your time. And now uh, at this point, we'll take uh, questions and. Uh, and uh, see if we can help you uh, uh, with your uh, issues. Okay, the first question that I have uh, is a procedure about how to do reverse phase chromatography on a combi flash RF 3000 plus. I presume that's the next gen 300 and it's very simple. Uh, we do have C18 columns that one can purchase. The most important thing is to change the solvents from normal phase to reverse phase. And one can flush the system with acetone or propanol. Uh, that solvent is miscible with the uh, normal phase solvents and the reverse phase solvents. And you can then flush the system with your reverse phase solvent and then you can uh, run the uh, reverse phase column. And uh, since I see your name over here, we could send you some more information about that uh, via email. The next question is, could you highlight on the concept of peak purity for herbals? Uh, I'm a little bit uh, confused about the question. I'm not quite sure what you're looking at, so you can follow up, but we can purify natural products in our systems and they do that very well. 
and what you would uh, do is uh, maybe run a column screen to see which column works the best uh, using wide polarity range chromatography, and then uh, you can optimize the chromatography after that. Another question about protocol for size exclusion using the combi flash. Um, suppose that would be something like Cephadex LH20, and we could send you an application note about that. Uh, we do have that on our website, and it would be a self-packed column. Another question that I have is how much sample do I need for a scouting gradient? On the uh, on the uh, CombiFlash AccuPrep, uh, you don't need very much. Uh, I often run 50 or 100 um, uh, microliters uh, for my scouting runs because I'm only looking to see where the compound comes out. I'm not trying to do a purification. So as long as I can see the peak, I can then uh, run a scouting gradient and then calculate the focus gradient. Uh, a follow-up question to that is, how do I perform scout runs and focus gradients on the flash system? And unfortunately, you can't do that very easily just yet. Uh, we, it can be done, and it will be in our software real soon now. But uh, essentially, you do need matching columns. And uh, when the time comes in a matter of uh, maybe just a few weeks to months, uh, you'll be able to do that on your system. And uh, since it's a next gen 300, uh, you will be able to get that software. On normal phase separation, uh, how does all PTV detector setting minimize the background from ethyl acetate? Uh, what we do is uh, we measure the spectrum for the ethyl acetate, and by doing signal processing, we can resolve the spectrum from the ethyl acetate, or for that matter, other absorbing solvents from the uh, samples. Uh, essentially, we do a uh, dot product of the uh, spectrum, and we subtract out, in a sense, the UV spectrum from the uh, solvent. I'd like to receive a uh, copy of uh, this presentation to review it in the uh, next few days. Uh, Yes, well, we can do that, and also the video will be online so that you can uh, play it back again. And I see uh, a, someone who asked about the reverse phase. I do see your email there, and I will uh, take that down so it doesn't get lost. Uh, how well do TLCs prepare you to estimate RF using normal phase? Uh, <clears throat> as it turns out, uh, it can do it very well, but you have to run the TLC plate uh, properly. Uh, I just submitted a paper to the Journal of Chemical Education, uh, and it's under review right now discussing that. Uh, just a funny coincidence there, but the most important thing is to make sure that your TLC chamber is saturated properly. Uh, that means that the top has to be on the uh, TLC chamber properly. You can't have any leaks. So if you're using a beaker as a TLC chamber, use aluminum foil to cover it and not a watch glass. And also give the uh, solvent a little bit of time to saturate the atmosphere inside your TLC chamber. Uh, the crit that I'm referring to, is that the same as a pre-column? Uh, no. Uh, inside of any column that you buy, there's going to be something called a crit, and that crit keeps the stationary phase in place inside the column. So every column has an inlet crit and an outlet crit. And if you don't filter your sample very well, what happens is that uh, material that isn't in solution covers the top of the frit, and it prevents the solvent and your sample from going through it and getting onto the top of the column. 
do you have any other questions? Okay, I thank you very much for your time and I hope you and your family stay well uh, during this uh, pandemic. And I hope everyone stays healthy and uh, that we all get back to work very soon.